things that I, I'm, I'm hoping for, and if, it, uh, if you can uh, catch it, it's a list of disciplines. And you've heard me preach for years now that we are believers in Christ when we get born again, and we're being discipled to be Christian. Uh, Roddy, I don't believe we're right off Christian. I think we're, we're believers first, and we can become like Christ. I'd love to call everybody I've met Christian, but the word Christian means Christ-like. And you're going to have to answer this question. Just how many days of the week are you Christ-like? Okay, I, just, I knew they'd be quiet in the house. It's okay. So we, we're, we're going through this process in life. But discipline, and what you have to have in order to be a disciple is discipline. And the issue there is, for us, is self-discipline. We have to discipline ourselves because actually nobody else is going to do it for us as we get older and mature. So discipline first and first in prayer. Amen. Be prayerful this year. Proper balance of the dependence issue. Without, you know, without God, there's not going to be any life. So you've got to stay connected with prayer. Second thing, amen, relational. And if it ain't on overhead, you can look back if you would like me. You can look behind you. But second would be relational. Some of you don't even know that camera's back there, but I can watch it. Look at that. I catch you breaking your neck. I don't know why. Relational, proper social integration. To introduce yourself to your family. Relational. To become relational this year. Work out a little bit more. My mother's birthday is today. Amen. You know I'm going to call her after church. I do it every, every year. But, but, I, but every week I call my mom between services. But today's a special day for me. My mother was born. Marie Brewer. So I'm excited about giving her a call. But you, you got to stay connected with your family. You know, as, as Jack is going through what I mentioned to you a while ago with his own daughter, he, he reconnected with her as they got older, and he just said, Pastor, we, I don't think we realize how important it is to stay connected with family and to give them that last hug, that last love, and, and to be unconditional in a lot of ways. Uh, sacrificial, the proper use of our resources, learning how to use your resources. Uh, um, maybe this is the year you empty out your storage building. Maybe this is the year you start uh, downsizing some, but become more sacrificial with what you have. Be worshipful, proper focus of control in all things to give God worship, and influential. Many of you have influence you don't even realize you have, but to learn how to use it in, in the proper influence of your life. What I always call the, the sphere. In other words, everybody has a circle. You don't, may not realize it, but you, you have your children, and you have extended, and you have people that you're connected with. Sometimes we forget just how influential we are. You know, I got a phone call last week of a man whose fiance is dying in the hospital. I hadn't seen him in 10 years, but he said, Pastor, you came to my mind. Hey, man, you, you have influence in my life. I want you to come. And David and I went and prayed for her, and uh, she's doing better, but she's still not out of the woods. The issue there was that influence. You forget how influential you've been. Numbers chapter 21. Are you comfortable? It came on for a minute. Will it not come back on, guys? Okay, just checking before I move into this. Numbers 21. If you have your Bible or find it on your phone or whatever the apparatus you use. By the way, Tuesday night, I will mention this. Bring your Bible. Bring you a notepad. Bring your pen. But, you know, uh, when you're praying, God will say things to you. You want to write it down. Amen. It may just be a certain scripture you want to really lean on this year, Bob. Amen. You know, I mean, you, when you're near death, you better get, uh, get the word in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4. They travel from Mount Or. Let, let me stop here to say this. The children of Israel exited the book of Exodus out of uh, Egypt. Moses leading them 40 years. You know the story. They cross the Red Sea. Tremendous miracle seeing the Red Sea parting. And they have to get to the other side. Uh, God cut off the, the enemy of uh, the Israelites. They traveled on looking for the promised land. Now this is type and shadow. May God give us some understanding from the word of God today to help us understand where we're at. And as they traveled, they had three folk that were very influential in their life. Moses, his sister Miriam, and his brother Aaron. Now, by this time, uh, Miriam has died. And I think about Moses being the youngest. And then Aaron, God said, now is the time for Aaron to depart. And they take Aaron, his brother, which you understand is Levitical or worshipful. So, so the, the main worship leader is fixing to pass from the scene. And so they go up on the hill, and they literally remove Aaron's uh, coat, and they put it on his son, amen. Then Aaron dies on the hill. The Bible describes this. It was like God said, okay, it's his time. He gave him a heads up. So Aaron goes up, and he passes, amen. So Moses, there's that alone feeling 
When people who have had influence in your life that you've loved have passed, particularly in this case, their relatives, Miriam, and who danced, amen, and also uh, Aaron. So now Moses is leading the children of Israel. He, he feels he has to feel almost alone here. They traveled from Mount Orb along the route of the Red Sea. One scripture says they went by the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient. There are certain times people are removed out of your life that other folks start taking pop shots at you because your shields are gone. You follow me? It ain't nobody. The friend you used to have that would take the hit for you, they gone now. Aaron's gone. Miriam's gone. Now the people are going to start complaining. So they get there and they get discouraged on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses. And they said, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water, and we detest this miserable food. When the Lord sent venomous snakes, by the way, when they said there is no bread, they lied. They got bread every morning. Every morning. So they, they lied about it. So I just want to tell you, they like us. We detest this miserable food. So they did get bread, but just didn't like what they were eating. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses now and said, Hey, I think we messed up. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And this is the way the people were. When Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, the people saw the lightning, they heard the noise, and they actually told Moses, you talk to God for us. And here I am, I will stand and tell you, it is not my place to talk to God for you. You got to talk to God to you for yourself. You got to talk straight to Jesus. Amen. You ain't got to go through mama. Hello. You ain't got to go through the preacher. Hello. You ain't got to go through a priest. Hello. You can talk directly to God. But the people were scared of God. They had this, this uh, primal fear of him that God was going to spank them, you know, and do something. So they told Moses, you talk to God for us. That was their mindset. We got to break that. Can I get an amen? Amen. Amen. I don't mind praying for you, but you have the same route as I do. You have the same ability. Matter of fact, I would tell you to pray for me. Amen. 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 To work that way. Okay, so the people came against Moses. We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, make a snake. Put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So may, Moses made a bronze snake. And he put it up on a pole when they, and when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. John chapter 3 verse 14 tells us, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness or the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. This is that, and you might want to write that scripture down, it's John 3 14. But when you look at it, it's telling us that even in the New Testament, they look back to the Old Testament and said, you know what, I see something there. As they took that snake that, that, that represents our curse, and they put it on a cross, excuse me, a pole, and they lifted it up in the air, and anybody that looked at it lived. In life, I'm telling you, if you can look toward the cross, if you can see what Jesus did for you, you're going to live. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's, it's an amazing understanding when we get here. But I'm going to pick apart this, and I'm going to lay down some things that the people got discouraged. They got a little upset because things didn't work out the way they thought it would. Father, I love you. There are many times we don't think life's going to turn out the way we thought it would. So I ask your blessing upon this word. Let us have something to hold on to, not just for this week, but throughout this year. In Jesus' name, and everyone sit. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Let me read that John 3 to you again, verse 14. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who looks at him or believes in him may have eternal life. I found that God has a wilderness for everyone. And you're not going to get to escape it. You don't always get to live in the city. Eventually, you're going to end up in the wilderness. You can be in the city, but at times, God's going to put you into a wilderness. Amen. John the Baptist's ministry was born out of the wilderness. Jesus' ministry 
was birthed out of the wilderness. Amen. Uh, the children of Israel, the nation, was birthed out of the wilderness. It's amazing what happens, you know, that, that God is looking to deal with us e even in the hard times. And it, it would appear that the greater things are born out of seasons of suffering than seasons of comfort. Amen. When things are comfortable, things are just comfortable. But man, when you go through a time of suffering in your life or you suffer with somebody else, things are born inside of you. They learn things in the wilderness. And I'll just give you an opportunity to jot these down. First, they learned of God's power. They saw God's power in the wilderness. Second, they learned to obey God. They followed the cloud. Uh, God said, listen, when you see the cloud move, you move with it. Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. Exodus 13, 21. By the day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of a cloud to guide them on their way. And by night, in a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of the people. So they would watch. And when they saw the cloud move, that's when they moved. If they marched at night, if they were watching the cloud. If the issue was pretty simple. Learn to follow or freeze. Learn to follow or burn up. Learn how to follow the cloud. Would you see the cloud? So they learned to obey God. They learned teamwork. They moved as millions of people. And this hits me. They, they, they always were moving camp. They would break it down. They would move. They would rebuild the camp. They would rest. They would eat. They would break it down. They would move. They would rebuild the camp. They would rest. They would eat. And they would have to do this sometimes days or, or weeks or months at a time. When God said move, then they moved. So they'd have to learn how. And this is teamwork, learning how to build things. I think this is the beginning when the Amish started. If you've ever seen them raise a barn, man, they can raise a barn. They can put things together. I remember when we first started out at the ranch, uh, we were going to t turn that tabernacle into a church. In one day, in one day, we orchestrated enough guys and, and, and gals to put the walls up around the side, put a south wall up. We had that thing almost boxed in in one day. I remember what a joy it was. When we came to this building here in just a few weeks, amen, we teamworked in here and we built things. I remember the man that gave me vision to build the sound booth. He you say, well, that's just a sound booth. Well, you don't understand. There's a ventilation shaft that runs through that sound booth. And I stared at that wall. And I thought, how are we, we going to put a sound booth? He said, Pastor Simple, we just put it underneath the booth. And I said, duh, why didn't I think of that? He said, because you're a preacher. <laughs> that man, I, I've already done his funeral. And we've seen it over and over as people come in here and begin to build and put wood and, and, and set things up. There's something about the teamwork that came together. They, they learned the chain of command while they were there. Jethro, the father-in-law, said, listen to Moses. And, Moses, and then he told Moses, Moses, listen to me. Unless you start turning some things over to the people, uh, to certain leaders in the house, you're going to, and he used the term, you're going to wear yourself out. Now, that's a good father-in-law that would come to you and remind you that my daughter, you, you know, used to my daughter unless you learn how to, delegate authority. Amen. Learn how to let it go. And the hardest thing as a business owner, a leader, a, a, a parent, a pastor, is learning how to delegate authority and then leave them alone and let them figure it out. Because it, it, can, it can be frustrating when you want things done your way all the time. Mm -hmm. Amen. Uh, they learned that God would never leave them. Forty years of circling the promises, God stayed with them, even though they were in rebellion. They learned repentance, amen, and rebellion. The vipers bit them here. And after that, though, the Scripture says the ground even opened up and swallowed some of them. There was an understanding that if I would look, I would live. If I repented, if I turned from my sins, God would have mercy on me. They learned that God was holy, amen. The Ark of the Covenant followed with them. They learned of God's glory, fire on the mountain, Moses in the tablets, the Ten Commandments. They learned that God was a God of order. He likes. I know some churches love chaos. I don't. I like order. I like knowing how things are going. I like now. I, I believe God can break out anytime He wants. Things can happen like that. But I just don't like walking into a place and wondering, is this how chaotic is this? Amen. I hate to bring a guest into a church. And I've seen this. Some of our people have moved. I've loved, I love our folk, but they've moved away. And some of them have gone to other churches, and they'll send back messages to me. Pastor, you wouldn't believe what's going on in this church. Amen. They're flying flags. I'm almost getting hit. And there's somebody yakking in tongues over here. They're moving over there, and they run around the bill. I'm scared. I don't know what's going on in here. Amen. And I say, so I smile and say, welcome to the country. Amen. Just, you know, that's not a problem. Let's ask you to drink Kool-Aid or hold this. Okay. That's, that's it. All right. Uh, they learned that they could trust God. 
that he could rain bread down from heaven, Exodus 16, 14. And it was daily. They learned that God would be a provider. Amen. That he would bring water out of the wilderness. Amen. Manna. One scripture says, Deuteronomy 29, 5. Just write this down for fun. It's a good footnote. 29 and 5, Deuteronomy. Yet the Lord says, during the 40 years that I led you through the wilderness, your clothes did not wear out, nor did the sandals on your feet. Forty years. This sounds like some of my dad's clothes. Forty years, the clothes never wore out. Now, here's the thing, though. They didn't have a change of clothes like we do. They might have one more set because they're traveling. And those clothes, and you realize, I have fallen. I've I've worked through life. I've worked in these clothes. I've I've set up toward it. But I I didn't have no holes in it. Can you imagine the, the miracle working power of God that your shoes never wear out. I got boots with holes in the bottom of them after a, a few years, but they never wore out. Can you imagine the, the stress on, on a wife that says to her husband, I, I need to go shopping, and he says, yeah, right. Them clothes ain't wearing out. Amen. There's nothing wrong. For 40, 40 years. Shy, you just a puppy. Your clothes have never wore out. And if they never wore out, that probably meant also you were able to wear them for 40 years. I know some of you, I've seen you post that you can still wear the same earrings you graduated in. <laughs> but can you imagine that you still wear the same clothes you graduated in? In other words, they stayed healthy through that time. You don't think about that. They're the same clothes 40 years. I'm wearing the same clothes. So that means I'm the same size. Mm-hmm. I'll leave me alone before I fast. We rarely think straight in times of discouragement. They got discouraged. Verse 4 says, but the people grew impatient on, on the way. Discouragement is a dangerous thing. The discouragement came on the trail of great victories. I've often said this, that it's easier to become victor- victorious than it is to stay victorious. Amen. You might win a victory, but to stay that way, to con- constantly be able to stay victorious is a powerful thing. They aim their discouragement at the wrong thing. Their leader, God, and their situation. Such is our country, America. And has been for as long as I've lived here, that oftentimes when we get upset or we get discouraged, we blame the, the higher powers. The governor, the president, we're going to blame other people, we're going to blame the, the principal of the school will bring, blame our parents. Amen. I'm discouraged, and it's your fault. Uh, somewhere you've got to say, I need courage so I can stand up and not be discouraged anymore. They focus on their problems and not the problem solver. The Scripture says in verse 4 that when they were traveling this time and got discouraged, they went by the Red Sea. When you went by the Red Sea, it should have said something to you, man. It should have said, right there was a spot. This thing opened up, and we walked through on dry ground. you got to remember your past victories in order to accomplish your future defeats. If you are ever going to get through life, you got to look back and say, I remember when God pulled me through this. David and Tony got me uh, something for Christmas. You'll never guess what it was. It was a pack of Rook cards. Do you remember the game Rook? I told y'all a couple of weeks ago that there was a green 12 that I had lost in a deck of rook cards, and I couldn't play with it anymore. And I worked for R.C. Cole, and I was flipping over boxes of empty cartons and a green 12. Not, not a red 6, not a yellow 11, but a green 12. One card came out of that box, and there it laid in Sheffield, Alabama. I lived out on the mountain, amen, in Tuscumbia. I know that's not my green 12, but I took it and put it in the deck. It matched, it fit. It was like God said, I got you, man. I got you. So he got me a deck of cards so I can always remember the Red Sea when I go by it. Every time I see it, I go, okay, I remember God. You are, you are good with the little things in my life. Amen. You've never left me nor forsaken. But yet when they went by the Red Sea, meh, 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 murmur, murmur, murmur. Everybody say murmur, murmur, murmur. You hear how that sounds? Huh? Yeah, it's just, it's just murmuring and, and upset and discouraged. You know, listen, guys, some things they should have understood there is that God was with them. He was guiding them. He was helping them. He loved them. Amen. God did not make it easy for them. This is the problem. God didn't make it easy for them. Amen. When there's no struggle, there's no strength. You already know that, that it's the exercise that we do. It's the, it's the weightlifting that you do. It's the pressing through that you do that has made you who you are. 
Amen. As you move through struggle in life, then your strength comes. You know, I, when, when I see young couples getting started, I remember the start, barely making it. Uh, you know, e everything meant something financially to be able to get any kind of overtime. I look back on life and realize it was the struggles that made me who I was. Amen. And then when the kids came, uh, yeah, I did, didn't, uh, didn't birth them, we adopted them. But in, an, in the adoption of those children, it was like, uh, how are we going to afford this? I don't know how. I don't. Somebody said, I got, I got a child. You want, yeah, I want it. I want the kid. Uh, you know, but, but I don't have no money. Is it, can we work out a payment plan? Uh, my, my, Josiah, my, my second, when, he was, when I got hold of him, I, I didn't have the money to pay the lawyer. I didn't have the money to pay the doctors. Uh, you know, he, was, uh, he came from Tinker Air Force Base. Amen. It was a situation that God just brought us in. It was out of relationship, in a sphere of relationship through preachers. My, my daughter was the same way. A pastor called me when, 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 when he knew. I'll tell you what, it was David Cook. David Cook had called, uh, which is your mom and dad's pastor now. Amen. Ca called me and said, look, there's a baby in Fort Smith, Arkansas. We went up and picked up Mandy. I didn't know Mandy. I didn't know. She didn't, I didn't even ask what, what uh, ethnicity, what color. I didn't care if she was purple and polka dot. She's going to be my baby. Amen. So it got made. Then Josiah was the same way. But when I got Josiah, I mean, it was like financially, I'm on the road. I'm traveling. I, I, I'm making it, uh, you know, just preaching revivals and doing the best we can. Living in an Aerostar van. And I'll, I'll never forget, he slipped over his mother's arm, over her shoulder at a swimming pool. Amen. And hit his head on concrete. And his head went the size of a watermelon. He was five months old. And he just exploded like this. And they rushed him to the hospital. I remember going and putting my hands on him in the, in the cradle. Prayed over him. He's got tubes coming out of him. They showed me the x-ray of the crack in his skull. And, and had it not cracked, his brain would not have been able to swole to the place of, of actually a miracle. The next day, his brain had gone down. Yeah, it is absolute. He's well, as you know, as far as I can tell, no damage. He's 26 years old now. The miracle was this. The pastor said, man, look, I, I'm sorry. It's not your fault, sir. He said, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to send a letter out to pastors I know who are connected with you and ask them to help you financially with, with the medical bills. I didn't have no insurance. I said, that, that would be kind. I'm not asking for it, but that'd be kind. He sent out a letter, and there was so much love for my family and that little boy, that finances came in, that not only did we pay off his medical, I had to ask what to do with the excess of it. I was going to send it back to people, and they said, no, use it to pay off his adoption. So I was able to pay off the kid's adoption, and every time I look and I say, God, you are a way maker. You, we, you make a way where there seems to be no way. You can part red seas. You can do things. And then 2020, I want to remind you, he is a way maker. Amen. You are never going to get to a place where God can't make a way for you if you trust him and stick with him. Can I get an amen? Now, what you got to watch out for in life is what I call emotional intoxication. Emotional intoxication. Let me say that to you again, Josiah. Emotional intoxication. Amen. When your emotions become so uh, enamored that you're intoxicated. Now, it can work on the opposite side. It's not always positive. Moses got emotional, amen, at times, and he struck a rock instead of speaking to it. It got him in trouble. Abraham got in trouble when he went into Hagar. Elijah, he, he, he was, he, the emotion hit him. In other words, it's a loss of balance. You lose balance. Elijah asked God to kill him. Jonah asked God to kill him. Amen. Noah got drunk after the, uh, after the ark ride. Well, that's another sermon. Esau sold his birthright for beans. Samson gave his secrets away. Peter went back to fishing. you got to be careful of the loss of balance in your life. Discouragement is a terrible thing. For sale. All my tools are for sale. Written on a, a door owned by Satan. All my tools are for sale. You can have the tool of lust and the tool of greed. You can buy the tool of, of arrogance, pride. You can buy all these tools. So people went into the store to look at all the tools that Satan had for sale, the evil that men have done to one another, and could buy that and own that gift. But then he walked over, and there inside of a case, a man asked, can I buy that? He said, no, you can't have that. He said, well, why can't I have that? He said, because that's my favorite tool. He said, what is that tool? 
It looks worn out. He said, it's a wedge. A simple wedge. And he said, that's all I need to use on believers. To be able to put it into the crack and push open their heart so that I can make them mad and discouraged at God from then on as if God is never going to do anything for them. All I need is a wedge. You can buy all these other tools, but leave me this one wedge. Amen. They were much discouraged. Many times we get discouraged because our theology is wrong. Come up, Josiah, I'm going to have to cut this short. Their theology is wrong. I call it erroneous theology. Pastor Mike and I talk about this all the time. What I used to preach 35 years ago, 30 years ago, 40, almost 40 now. I started preaching when I was 19. I'll be 59 next month. For 40 years. I go back and I look at some of them sermons and I go, ain't no way in the world would I preach that again. I was, I was hard about certain things. I was mean towards certain people. And, and I found out that this erroneous idea, when God fails to live up to your theology, here's a great idea. Change your theology. Amen. I remember, uh, you know, you got to baptize this way. If you don't baptize Father, Son, Holy Ghost, you, you know, you're, you're in trouble. If you don't baptize Jesus' name, you're in trouble. So I, when I started pastor, I just put all of them together. I baptize the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and as the disciples care for the commandment in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Get them all. That way I either offend everybody, but either way, I'm trying to make God happy. Can I get an amen? Amen. So it's important. You've got to let the word come to you. We've missed something here. They didn't learn as they were being discouraged. As, as, as life begins to happen to you. This, listen to this. Philippians chapter 1. Write this down. The Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. Before he was Paul, he was Saul. He's the writer of two-thirds of the New Testament epistles. Saul. Saul of Tarsus. Saul had a theological ideas. The scripture says of him, without us looking it up, that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. In other words, I, I'm, I'm, I'm better than any other Pharisee. I know the first five books of the Bible, uh, for Genesis, Exodus, uh, Numbers, you know, you know, the first five books. I can quote them front and back. I'm a man with a message. Now, here's the issue in life. You may have a study of the Bible, an understanding of, of some of the scriptures. But until the message starts to make you. This is the, here's the thing that happens. The message has to make you. The man don't make the message. The message makes the man. And as you move through life, it begins to formulate you. It begins to work on you. So here is a man full of hatred and self-righteousness. He knows the Bible and, or, or the Pentateuch. And what does he do? He goes out and he begins to kill Christians. He begins to kill people uh, of Christ. Amen. Begins to take them out. Stephen being one of us. Had the little boy stoned. Fifteen-year-old teenager, 16, has him stoned to death. Amen. Has written in his hand, paperwork in his hand to have other Christians killed. And then God knocks him down. He he goes through a blinding, then he goes through a miracle, something happens in his life, and this man of, of hardness, hardness, I've seen it, I've seen parents say, if my kids ever divorce, they are never allowed, allowed back in my house, I've heard parents say it, hmm. and that child go through something, and you got to make up your mind that you're going to love that child, or get over your theology. <coughs> if, if my child turns it becomes homosexual. I never listen to me. I don't care who you are. You may not like to sin, but you need to love them. Mm -hmm. You just—that's all you got, man. You got to keep loving them. You got to keep. You got to let God deal with all that. And I'm not—I'm not promoting it at all. But if my kid ever gets back on drugs, I ain't giving another nickel. <sighs> my daddy don't come visit me. Hmm. We go through these things in our theology. The word begins to own us. It begins to work in us. They looked at Paul later in life and they said, we're going to kill him. I'm going to kill you, Paul. And they, they did. They stoned him once. God raised him from the dead, brought him back. They, they beat him. He, they put him in prison. You know what Paul said? I love what Paul said. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. The word owns me, man. You want to kill me? It's gain. I'm going to gain if you want to kill me. Well, we can't kill him. Let's just let him live. Okay, to live is Christ. 
Amen. I, I'm, I can keep on living. In verse 22, if I, am go, if I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart, to be with Jesus which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. When I read this, I realize the message found Paul. He didn't find the message. The message made the man. The man does not make it. They make it. You cannot carry what you have not received. Amen. And Paul began to receive grace. He became a man of grace and mercy, bridging the gap between Jew and Gentile. There were those who tried to kill him. Mm -mm. It's gain. The Zoe says, let him live. He said, it's, it's Christ. They said, well, if you can't do that, we'll make him suffer. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, I'm strong. Let me read that to you again. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. I delight in weaknesses. In insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. You want to persecute me? You want to make me suffer? Let me tell you something. Bring it on, man. Because mm. I'm going to tell you, the message has made me. And there's going to come a time in your life, you're going to hit a wilderness wall. You're going to go through some hard times. And all of a sudden, the word is going to start coming alive in you. Greater is he that's in me Amen. than he that's in the world. Right. Then we have this treasure in earthen vessels that is Christ in me, the hope of glory, that this world Amen. needs to see Jesus. And if I got to endure this hardship, if I got to endure this sickness, if I got to endure this financial pain, if I got to do this relational issue, amen, I'm going to endure it for Christ's sake. I'm going to smile about it. I'm going to believe the peace of God. And I'm going to realize that waiting is not a bad thing. Amen. If I got to wait on him, I'll wait. Stand with me. I'm going to throw something at you real quick. How do I keep from getting discouraged? Stay in the Word. Amen. Stay in the Word. That's right. Amen. Let the message become you. Stay in the Word. If LSU loses tomorrow night, stay in the Word. I'm pulling for you tomorrow night. I really am. First time in my life, my God, I'm in conflict. Stay in the Word. Get the Word in you. Second, and what's important about that is guard what's going in. Guard what is going out. Second, stay focused on the right things. Philippians 4, 8. You know the scripture. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, noble, right, true, uh, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent. Think about these things. Stay in fellowship. If you, if you want to find a good way to be discouraged, split off from somebody. It's the banana that leaves the bunch that gets peeled. I ate a banana this morning for breakfast. I've already started. Say, okay, I gotta, can't just eat anything I want. No junk. I grabbed me a banana. I peeled it off the bunch right there. The rest of them were fine. But the one that got left got peeled. You separate yourself. Ecclesiastes 4, 9. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Mm. New Testament says one has set a thousand devils to flight, two ten thousand. If we got friendship, if we're connected, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. When Jesus sent them out, he sent them out two by two. That principle works in all religions. You never, I've never seen a Mormon by himself. <laughs> JWs are the same way. We as believers, we separate and we become rebels for Jesus. That ain't working. We've got to stay together. Right. Got to stay connected. And then just stay. Ephesians 6 says, after you've done all to stand, just stand. Just stay with it. I'm telling you, don't doubt in the dark. And, and, and the greatest of us can get discouraged. The greatest of us can get separated. Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, goes to prison. He's going to lose his head. He's rebuked to Herod. Throw him in jail. He's going, to he's going to be beheaded. It's the most terrible thing. That a girl did a little dance. And in the, after the dance, the question was asked, what do you want for that little dance? I could get vulgar here. I won't. She said, I want. Mama said, we want the head of John the Baptist. John sends word to Jesus. 
Are you really Him? Are you really Him? When tragedy hits you enough, you'll question, are you really Him? Hold on, John. You baptized me. We ran together. We cousins. Mm -hmm. Amen. We connected in the womb. You remember that? Amen. I made you jump. But you're doubting right now. Jesus said, tell John, the lame walk, the blind see. Blessed is he that is not offended with me. Don't take the bait, son. Don't get offended with me. Jesus didn't come visit him. I think he was just saying, I'll see you in, I'll see you in a little bit. <laughs> Amen. You're barely going to beat me to heaven, but I'll see you in a little bit. We'll get together again. The principle there is don't doubt in the dark what God has showed you in the light. When God shows you something in the light, don't doubt when you get in the dark. Amen. He's still for you. He still loves you. Amen. He still got you. The scripture says, when you pray, when you give, when you fast. When you pray, Matthew chapter 6, when you give, when you pray, don't, don't stand out in the middle yelling at everybody. And He's not talking about a corporate church. He's talking about Walmart. All right. Don't, don't try to show, give me attention here. When you give, don't do it where everybody knows that you're doing it in order to get glory for yourself. And he says, uh, when you fast, if I could paraphrase, when you fast, put a toothpick in your mouth so it looks like you already ate. I'll keep a toothpick around me all the time. Started years ago. It's, uh, the guys will tell you, I got toothpicks everywhere. Yeah. Amen. They're like glasses. I put one in my mouth. It makes it look like I've already been eating. Amen. But when you do this corporately, you can encourage one another. As I told my pastor this morning, I said, Pastor Mike, I'm going to start fasting. He said, I'm going to join in with you. I'm going to fast with you for the next 21 days. I'm going to do that because I, I want to be connected so we can encourage one another. Amen. Ronnie, if I could get you guys real quickly. A couple of you guys. I got some over here. No, I don't. So they're all over here. If you want one of these, hand me one, Ronnie. If you want one of these, we're going to anoint ourselves with oil. The scripture says that when you fast, anoint your head with oil. If you need one, go ahead and start passing them out. I think our church pretty much knows about this. Do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they are fasting, disfiguring their faces, show men they're fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, stay with me. If you've never done this, I didn't know what it was either. I didn't understand fasting. I didn't understand giving. I didn't understand praying. I didn't understand worship. And I had to learn these things that I got in the house. And I had to do away with some of my erroneous ideas about church life. But fasting is giving up something in order to gain something else. Most of the time, fasting has to do with food. Sometimes it has to do with entertainment. But it's going to be up to you to what you decide to fast. Sometimes, uh, and, and here, here it gets a little explicit here. The scripture says even fasting is uh, abstaining from sex. Yeah, that husband and wife gave uh, some, a little time off. Amen. They fasted. So, the script, so in, in doing that, when I give up something, okay, now I got a little more time for the Word. I got more time to communicate to God. I got more time to, to talk. Now, I'm going to tell you something the medical field will not tell you. Now, some of them may tell you. But most folk, we've got this three meals a day thing. It does not hurt you to go a, without a meal. It will inconvenience you. But it won't hurt you. It won't hurt you. To go without certain foods. Like I, fried foods, breads, cinnamon rolls, bonbons, <laughs> bluebell. See, I'm, I'm naming all the nice stuff in life. You're not punishing yourself. It's not a diet, and you're not punishing yourself. You're saying, what I'm doing is I'm going to back away from a little more TV. Or, or if you're a gamer, to, to leave the games alone for a little while. I'm going I'm to set aside some things here in my life. Now, I have fasted football. I have fasted meat. I have fasted 
total food. But the one thing you can't go without is water. Lots of water. When Jesus fasted 40 days, it never said he went without water. He fasted food. Now, if you're under medical supervision, of course you need to consult your doctor or, 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 or Google it. Google MD. Find out what it is that you need to. But most of us are so soft on ourselves. It's so soft. David, open this so I don't splatter it everywhere. Now, this is the hard thing. The scripture says, when you fast, anoint your head with oil. For years, I would anoint everybody. H. I'd line them up, pray over everybody. I didn't care four or five hundred people. I'd pray over everybody. Anoint you at all. Then I reread it again. It said, when you fast, you anoint your head. Mm -hmm. Well, then I missed it. I realized I don't take your aspirin for you. Right. I don't know how aspirin works. I don't. All I know is when my head hurts, if I can take an aspirin, most time it'll go away. My dad would say a BC powder. Make that headache go away. I watched him take that powder and just dry, dry, just hit it. Never asked why that work. Well, what's oil on the head do, Pastor? I don't know. Can I tell you? I don't know. All I know is through Scripture. I got it. I got it. That, that through Scripture, the anointing was important. And they anointed the priest. The Scripture says when you're praying for the sick, anoint them with oil. It has something to do with contact. It has something to do with, with uh, the, the, anoint, the anointing. Somebody asked me, said, Pastor, what business? I'm in the oil business. Henry, I'm in the oil business right here. That oil business. Anointing people, praying over people. And the anointing always had something to do with an unction. An unction is that, that jumping up out of your chair when your team scores a touchdown and you didn't think you were able to move. All of a sudden, you realize your husband got healed. <laughs> that unction, that movement. Hey Amen. When you hear the belt coming through the house, and that kid takes off unctioning through the house. <laughs> that unction, you know what I'm talking about? There's an unction that comes with this. So I'm going to ask you to anoint yourself. And I'm going to ask you to do this. Keep this. And whenever you are ill, sick, man, I, I put oil on my knees. I had a horse showed up once that had a West Nile disease. It was literally dragging its back legs. It was a white horse. We named it Pepper. And my daughter, my daughter would take liniment and rub it on that horse's legs and call it anointing. Because liniment is an oil. And she'd pray over that horse. She barrel raced on that horse. She won trophies on that horse. But when that horse came in, it looked like there was no hope for that horse. And she prayed over it. Pray over your animals. Amen. Oil is a powerful thing. Amen. So together, if you want to fast with us for the three days, five days, 21 days, and start setting yourself, Father, in the name of Jesus, we anoint ourselves with oil. We ask that you bless, you strengthen, you help us. Help us to be persevering, to have self-control, to do the things you've called us to do over the next few days. In Jesus' name. And everyone say it. Amen. Put your cap back on. Put it in your purse, your pocket. Be seated for just a minute. I get our servant leaders to come up. Mm. There's a solemnness to fasting. And we're going to tell you something. If you go a couple of days... When you're sick, you will fast. Your body will shut down on you. And you'll find yourself fasting. You'll be able to eat. Your body just says, I can't take it no more. You, it needs healing. It needs rest. You keep shoving them cheeseburgers up in here. <laughs> Justin, I can't get no rest. Amen. So take a little rest. Use it as an opportunity. Nicotine, caffeine, uh, uh, pharmaceutical drugs, alcohol, anything like that, just set aside. Say, okay, I, I need to deal with this my life and it's personal to you get get a, get somebody to partner with you get two or three people to partner with you and i just i just what i'm going to do i'm going to i'm going to try some things this month i've never done uh, i i everybody tells me pastor you need to drink more water i don't drink a lot of water so why about this next 21 days nothing but water just drink water 
Let's see what happens. It was, I tell you, all it's going to do is make me healthier. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, you'll miss a Dr. Pepper, a Diet Coke, yada, 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 sugar. But it's not going to hurt you. you you're going to make it. You'll, I'll see you in February. Right. You'll be healthier. Amen. More spiritually inclined, motivated. Amen. Sharp. Hallelujah. Looking forward to a cheeseburger. I've got to close to this. i got to go. But I, I fasted so much, but I remember doing this. On the, at 12.01, 12 the day after the fasting was over, <laughs> I went down to Jack in the Box and got a double cheese. You know what I'm talking about, the big cheeseburger? There's just cheese, meat, and bread. Ultimate cheeseburger. I, Ronnie knows a little bit about that. I see. <laughs> Ultimate. Ultimate cheeseburger. That's funny. I, I can't remember being so sick in all my life. Uh -huh. Your body ain't ready for a ribeye or ultimate cheeseburger or tacos. You got to ease back into it because yep. you're going to shock that body. Amen. So I'm just giving you a heads up as we move through the month. Amen. Tuesday night, we'll have prayer here, uh, 730. Saturday, we'll have a roundtable meeting. Of course, it's not, you don't see it over here, but we'll have a men's roundtable meeting out at the ranch at 830. Bring your shotgun and bring your shells. Amen. Go have a little skeet shoot, guys. And, and we will have some food there for those that want to eat. Uh, you know, not everybody's fasting food. Some are fasting other things. So we will have a skeet shoot out at the ranch Saturday. Uh, Steve, thank you for going to bring us out some, some fancy sk sk skeet slingers. Amen. The kids are getting tired of throwing them in the air. Uh, so we, we got those, all right? So come out Saturday, men. We'll, we'll keep that announcement going. If you need to tie the offering envelope, lift your hand. Let's be a little bit more studious. When you pray, when you fast, when you give. It ain't if you give. It's when you give. Amen. And this is our opportunity to give. Yeah, so again, we will be having a, a prayer night. Uh, Ezra 8.23 says, So when we fast and petition our God about this, He answered our prayers. So we want our prayers answered, obviously, in 2020. So come out, pray with us. Uh, January 18th, again, this weekend, we're going to have a skeet shoot. Jewels for Christ celebration, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, New Beginnings, Crosby Campus. Here, this Saturday, you want to say something? Come on. There you go. Amen. 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 Uh, again, we have a ladies' ministry as well with Miss Diane Phelan. Lift. Um, see her in the back. Um, off road misfits are going to be in the bookstore. So if you want to sign up for that, if you want to hang out with uh, Mike Thies and all the guys uh, and ladies um, at 3 p.m. at 10810 Stevens Lane, Houston, Texas, serving hamburgers and hot dogs, bring a side dish and your favorite game to share. Um, it will be in the book store. They need to know how many people are going so they know how many hot dogs and hamburgers to make. So please sign up in the back. As we're leaving God today jobs and better jobs.